Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jennifer Batsmeyer from Princeton University, and you are in the um, session for application profiles. <laughs> okay. So this morning we have two speakers, and I'll introduce them before their respective speeches. So our first speaker this morning is Paul Walk. He's an information professional um, specializing in scholarly communications, repos repository systems, and metadata management. His consultant firm is Antlead, which he started in 2017, and that, that firm works with higher education museums, libraries, and archives. Also, Paul is also the managing director of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. His areas of expertise include scholarly communications, open access and repository systems, metadata development, web systems development, and research data management. Um, the topic of Paul's talk this morning is DCMI and application profiles. The concept of the metadata application profile has for two decades been a central focus of attention in the Dublin core community and has underpinned many of DCMI's development efforts. There continues to be a significant community interest in developing tools to help people create and document application profiles, and more recently, in technologies for validating data produced according to the profiles. This talk will describe a new initiative to respond to this interest. The concept of the metadata, oops, I'm gonna stop there because I pasted it twice. So, <laughs> so, and with, with that, here's Paul. <laughs> I'm in Boston. Um, I don't know what turned out. So this is what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning. So um, getting some caveats out of the way quickly. Um, I'll talk very briefly about the ECMI. I'm assuming that you all have some familiarity with the core of ECMI. Um, I'll talk a little about the um, some of the historic stuff which the ECMI has been involved in in developing application profiles because it's some of that's useful background context. Uh, the main part of the talk will be about the new community group which we formed um, around this and the new project which that community group is, is um, engaged in now. Um, <coughs> and then if I've managed to, <coughs> excuse me, whet your interest at all, then uh, I'll talk briefly about how you can get involved if you want to. So getting the caveats and excuses in early, that's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a librarian. Sorry about that. Some of my best friends are librarians. Actually, I've worked uh, in and around academic libraries um, for a large part of my career. Uh, that's really where I started. Um, so, really, just to introduce DCMI. So, um, I took over as managing director of DCMI uh, roughly two years ago, and. Um, what I've been trying to do over that two years is to figure out really what direction this organization needs to go in next. Now, Dublin Core um, is a very well-established um, brand of, and, and the, uh, the vocabulary and the set of specifications which um, people are using uh, fairly universally. I mean, uh, Dublin Core most basic terms are ubiquitous, really. Um, but it definitely has a, a sense and a perception of having been done and finished long ago. Um, and in actual fact, there's, there's a lot more which could be done there. So working with quite a lot of people in the community, we've been um, gradually figuring out what, what we should really be um, focused on next. We still have a lot of support. We have paying organizational members who are 
are interested not only in just ensuring that we are sustained and that we continue to look after these specifications and so on, but also we, we develop into new directions. So as a way of focusing this effort, what we did was took the website, which is one of the oldest websites in the world. I mean, the, the Dublin Corps was early into that. Um, and it's been in continuous production um, for, you know, 20, five years, I guess, by now, something like that. Um, I've done a lot of work with um, rebuilding websites in the past, and I nothing on the scale of the Dublin Core website. This is gigabytes of stuff, and it's all text. You know, It's not big multimedia files. It's just an extraordinary amount of material. So what we've done is try to um, represent Dublin Core around these, these sort of four themes, these four areas, which are stewardship, community, learning, and development, with stewardship being the one which is probably the most familiar. Um, the work that I'm going to describe today would fall more clearly into the development category. Um, this is really our um, first um, step to um, begin to look at developing new things. All of this is very new. I mean, this website was launched about um, just over a month ago, so it's all very Some specific new things which have, uh, we've done uh, recently, which you may find interesting in, in the library community. So um, we acquired a thing called the Link Data Competency Index, which was developed by the LD for PE project. Um, we had a, an arrangement, so I say we this slightly predates my time. This arrangement was uh, made in around about 2016, I think, um, with Washington University to. Um, <coughs> agree to take on and look after the outputs from that project for a minimum of two years. We think that the competency index itself is a potentially very valuable resource, so we're committed to looking after that um, for certainly well beyond two years. Uh, but what we would like to do is to try to engage more with uh, practitioners working with linked data to see to what extent this um, can become sort of frame for developing learning materials and other resources which help people who are involved in um, teaching, learning, training in the data. So um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would urge you to have a look at that. And we're looking for ideas and participation around that. Um, secondly, we've um, recently agreed to and, and have actually now taken on responsibility for the stewardship of the Bebo, the bibliographical ontology. Uh, which was a community-generated ontology. It's um, used quite widely, certainly in Europe. I'm not sure to what extent it's used in North America, but uh, um, that's something which um, hasn't really been developed in, in any kind of development for a long time. It's just one of those kinds of uh, static resources which people still use. But again, there's an opportunity to um, revisit that and, and perhaps look at um, how that could be uh, brought uh, more into a, a linked data view of the world and a, a more modern way of, of uh, doing that kind of ontology. Um, and the third thing to mention, just uh, our most recent new member who joined us in um, April this year is uh, Libraries and Archives Canada, which we're really pleased about because it's our first Canadian uh, organizational member. And um, for some reason, we seem to be uh, suddenly engaged with Canada quite uh, closely. So. The conference in 2020 will be in, um, in Canada, in uh, Ottawa. Okay, so that was the sales bit of DCMI, which I'm obliged to do. So um, on to the application profiles. So DCMI was early into the application profiles game. I mean, there, there are some people who claimed that it, the concept was really developed in the DCMI community. I'm not sure um, that I can um, necessarily assert that, but I've certainly heard this this said. Um, so, in, as, that, as that concept of application profiles in the Dublin core context, anyway, came to sort of gradually evolve. One of the I, I, the thing on the left there, that this um, notion of it being um, a way of bringing together. Um, Vocabularies from different namespaces in, into one um, 
profile is a really important aspect of what we're doing, and I think is somewhat unusual, certainly was unusual 20 years ago, um, or 10 years ago. Um, and it, it would be something I would really want to emphasize that um, everything that I'm going to talk about today, and including the historic stuff, was never limited to the Dublin Court at Calories. It was always about being able to mix and match from different data spaces to build a profile which could be used for some particular purpose. Um, this definition came from Rachel Geary and Manjula Patel, who were colleagues of mine at UConn uh, many years ago. And uh, well, it was quite a long time ago. <laughs> and um, I, I think that, although that's not a very precise definition, I think nonetheless it's kind of quite a useful working core uh, description of what we're talking about. So a little more history, um, there was this thing called the Singapore Framework. Hands off who's heard of the Singapore Framework. Good, okay. <laughs> um, this was a fairly ambitious attempt in 2000, uh, leading up to 2008, it was published then, to bring together um, quite a lot of aspects of the development and um, um, also uh, with a, a, some sort of uh, emphasis on documentation uh, of the gathering of requirements for it, sort of building up that package around application profiles of all of the necessary components to make them uh, properly described, properly documented, actionable and so on. It was quite ambitious. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Singapore framework has never been really um, instantiated in any sense. Um, but I think that a lot of the thinking behind this has been quite influential. Um, and in fact, from it emerged um, one of the components was the description set profile, which I think has been pretty influential um, and is still being examined even in the new work, which I'm about to describe. Uh, it's been suggested to me that um, the, 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 the sort of top level structure there very much influenced uh, the, the origins of Big Frame, and certainly Eric Miller was involved in in this when he was um, first working on the frame. And we'll come on to this in a little more detail later, but you'll see some, some obvious parallels. And then we're going to have a talk all about bit frame after this anyway, so I won't go too much into detail there. Um, I won't dwell on this, but this is um, probably you know, at the extreme end of the sort of um, thinking and, and work and development that's going on around that time uh, as part of the um, Singapore framework. Um, the Dublin Core Abstract Model, which um, I think it's fair to say was probably a step too far <laughs> in terms of modelling, um, hasn't really um, become the foundation of anything in particular. But again, there was some very interesting thinking. It, the, the thing about the Dublin Core community then, and I hope going forward, was that it's a community which is extremely open and tries to do all of its thinking in the open, um, all of its online and so on, public discussions. And so this kind of thing is um, really uh, useful occasionally just to reflect on and look back at them and see the sort of genesis of some of these ideas. But I won't dwell on this. This is, uh, this is one for the, uh, for the archives, really. Um, and then a, a slight change of tack, but I think this is something which um, I'm particularly interested in. Um, it's slightly tangential to probably what we'll mainly talk about today, but I want to just flag this up. So one of the problems with application profiles, in my view, is how, how they develop. Um, if you want to help a community to develop an application profile to enable it to do some uh, process within its domain of interest that involves interoperability between different standards and so on, then you need somebody who understands how to construct application profiles to work closely with people who probably know nothing about that sort of thing but understand their domains. And so we did some work at UConn, uh, this is um, Emma Tonkin's work, she was a colleague of mine at UConn at the time, to figure out how we could engage with domain experts who have no information science uh, training or background whatsoever, and how we could get from initial um, 
exercises with those people through the sort of process of, of coming up with a formally described application profile. So there were all kinds of interesting um, experiments with paper prototyping and card sorting exercises and this sort of thing, culminating in actually developing some pretty interesting software that you can use on a, a whiteboard to actually assemble um, you know, entities and properties and relationships and so forth. And it would save all of the decisions that people made and then we could generate documentation from that. So that was kind of quite cool at the time. Didn't really um, take it any further, but that was largely because of um, you know, the usual vagaries of funding and so on, rather than any comments on the work, I think. So, um, as part of sort of trying to reboot uh, DCMI, we started to, uh, we reviewed um, nearly a hundred um, community groups that have existed over the years of Dublin Court. Um, retired a great deal of them when they had sort of been run out of steam over the years or, or hadn't really been active for a long time. Uh, we've kept a, a few of them going, but we've uh, introduced some new ones, and um, this is the one which is relevant here. So this is really only three or four weeks old, uh, but it already has um, Quite a few people have joined. Um, there's a mailing list, the usual um, sort of things. And this has been shared by Karen Coyle. Um, and pretty much everything I'm about to talk about next, I'm just channeling Karen Coyle. In fact, I was going to print this out and then just sort of wear it <laughs> like this. <laughs> so uh, Karen is chairing that group, but she's also um, done a lot of the work to sort of seed the project which this group is overseeing um, with uh, thinking about application profiles. There's a GitHub repository. Um, most of the discussion that's interesting at the moment is actually happening in the GitHub repository on the issues. Um, because what we've probably explained at the moment, we're gathering use cases and so on. And so the comments threads there is where quite a lot of the, uh, the action is at the moment. But there is a discussion list as well. So you only need to make a note of that one URL if you're interested. Uh, and all of the links to everything I'm going to describe uh, are on that one page. Okay? I've got that link at the end as well, so you can get away from it. So to actually come to this, this new project then. Um, so as it should be apparent, that this concept of application profile is kind of dear to our hearts at the CMI. Um, and then we have realised there is still a really strong uh, community interest in developing this idea further. It's seen as sort of unfinished business, I think, by quite a lot of people in the community. Um, there's a particular interest in validation as well. Um, so quite a lot of the people who are interested in working with us are also very interested in working with things like Shacks and Shackle. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because that's a whole other presentation, but um, that is one of the, the sort of specific drivers. I would say my own um, interest, apart from the, the thing about agile development, is also finding very um, easy ways of documenting and publishing these things. It's really important. And at DCMI, we've done a lot of work recently on um, looking at things like uh, static site generators for using um, things like Markdown to generate very uh, low-cost, low-resource websites that can be easily maintained. Well, this is the aim of the project. So um, this, this idea, like Dublin Core is famous for its core vocabulary. That is what, um, this is what we do. And it, it's, um, I think that the, the discussions are, are fairly uh, yeah, providing this a fairly clear notion that um, that trick of having a core vocabulary could be useful uh, in the world of, of describing application profiles as well. Something which is quite small, quite universal, and gives a, a general level of interoperability. It's the sort of thing that Dublin Core does. Um, so yeah, the outputs are, which we're expecting to produce uh, um, use cases, so we're already gathering those, um, generating those. 
um, figuring out what the requirements are. Now, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And there's a sort of a general understanding and consensus that there is a problem to be solved, but we need a lot more clarity about what that problem actually is. And gathering use cases is one way of helping to, to get to that point. Um, this working assumption that basic vocabulary is what's needed. Um, and then aligning this with similar efforts uh, or related efforts going on, such as the validation work and so on. So example workflows, examples, maybe even a demonstrator, some kind of demonstrator system. Not um, beyond the bounds of possibility if we are able to find a way to use the things which we've been having some success with recently, like static site generators and so on. So quite sort of ambitious, but um, we're not under any time pressure. Um, we tend to think in decades of doubling the course, so uh, um, I hope this won't take decades, but uh, it's, not, it's not one of these things where we have a deadline to get something knocked out by the end of the next month. You know, so this, this could take a few months. So um, Karen Coyle has already uh, produced a sort of initial requirements document, which is more or less structured around these, these questions, you know, why, who, what, and how. Um, and I think that's something which could actually be really useful, just to really pin down, you know, what is the, what, why are we doing this, and, and who is going to benefit, and broadly, how do we think this will work? Um, the how is, um, interesting because I think the Dublin Core community and certainly the people involved so far are probably more focused on the what and the who and are sort of assuming the why and aren't really thinking about the how just yet. I'm a software guy actually, I'm not really a metadata guy as such, although I do a lot of work in metadata, so I tend to be very interested in the how, I'm always interested in but so the order of these things is interesting, I think, um, and this is not uncommon, I think, in, in um, these kinds of projects, actually, it's um, the how might come a bit later. And again, uh, channeling Karen, um, she's identified these um, patterns of, of constraints. So a lot of, um, really, the, the, the work to um, come up with universal models for application profiles is, a lot of that is going to be about how to express constraints in an interoperable way. Uh, and that's where this work dovetails very closely with the um, validation work, you know, it checks and tracks and so on. Um, <coughs> so trying to get this down into, into an English um, you know, actually explain these things as, as part of this project. Um, so I think this is interesting. Like Karen's identified five primary types of relationship between these, and so this is the entity to entity, property to property, entity to property, property to value, and value to value. <coughs> and then some of the sort of patterns of what those constraints could actually be. It's not, that's not an exhaustive um, <coughs> list of examples, but it's reducing the And then uh, a couple of other things um, which emerged from the historic um, Dublin Core Application Profiles work. This notion of a of, um, primary entity. So in the world of RDF and graphs, um, and I think this, this sort of problem comes up all the time, actually. I've noticed this in other contexts. Um, we have this tension between the graph and the record. And a lot of the thinking about application profiles, I think, tends to presuppose that there's something that's not dissimilar to a record being um, described. You, know, you have a set of constraints which are going to be applied to a thing, and that thing is somewhat like a record. It might be part of the graph, but it's... And so this idea of having a primary entity, which is essentially the, the starting point in the graph, you know, it's the, where, where does this um, thing that you're describing in the application profile begin in the graph? That's what that's um, 
talking about. And then if that has an identifier, that becomes essentially a record identifier. These are quite grey areas, and I think this is uh, one of the areas which is quite interesting to sort of figure out. Um, and then the, um, the other, one of the other constraints is this notion of open or closed. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you have an application profile which specifies a whole bunch of um, entities and properties and value constraints and so on, um, if you're um, running a validation exercise and you receive some data uh, which uh, which satisfies all of those, but has some extra uh, entities and properties in it. Is that actually an invalid? Does that invalidate that um, that thing or not? That's really more of a question. Or perhaps a, a more subtle way of saying: How do you deal with the extra stuff that you quite typically receive? I guess you can just ignore it. So um, again, this is Karen's work. He started to um, compare some of the existing vocabularies used to describe application profiles. Um, and um, this is in a, a table on, on the GitHub repository, which I gave you a link to. So um, there are columns here for the Dublin core description set profile, the DCAP entity there. Um, Sinopia is in here somewhere. Yeah, um, big frame, uh, and we can obviously add to that if there were other vocabularies that were pertinent. So this is a an incomplete um, and somewhat experimental way to try to relate these vocabularies to see see what commonality uh, mappings we might be able to to extrapolate from that. And then a similar table, but this is just really. Um, trying to figure out the um, if we were starting from scratch essentially what, what elements would we want to have in a, um, to describe application profiles. Um, so this is built around this description set, description statement value structure. So as I said, we were gathering use cases. Um, this is an approach which I can recommend. Um, I've, tried, I've used this in other projects, but perhaps some of you have too. But, um, using GitHub issues as a way of gathering um, user requirements is, is actually quite a handy thing to do. Um, I think it's, um, we've been quite flexible with this one. It's actually perhaps sometimes better to be uh, a, lot, a bit stricter about the format of the, the idea of gathering user stories single sentence um, and then allowing people to extrapolate from that sentence but you start with the statements you know, a user story says um, a, a particular type of a user wants to do something in order to achieve some benefit that's that's the statement uh, but we have a little bit of that in here but some of them are a little bit more kind of random and scarcity <laughs> but nonetheless they're quite interesting We've gathered, I think, about eight so far um, in the course of really a couple of weeks. So, uh, and uh, some of those have got pretty long uh, discussion threads already. So, there's quite a lot of discussion very in there. Um, some of it very interesting. We'd definitely like to gather more. So, um, if you were interested, you'd be very welcome. So, this is open, anybody can do this. Um, there are also some other issues in there which are not use cases, which are just other discussions. Quite interesting. Um, so a few of those. One of the discussions is what to call things. So again, we have this description set, description statements, and value. This is what we seem to have converged on so far, but that could change. Um, and this is broadly the equivalent in big frame, I hope. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not uh, very, very uh, strong on big frame, I'm afraid. So. Um, Yeah, so in this um, statement is essentially the, the property um, in target terms. Um, yeah, this discussion about what to call it. So, um, well, I just, I just said that, so I won't say it again, sorry. There's a bit of an extra slide there. And then, yeah, related to that is the, the basic structure. Um, 
This is the um, particular issue. So if you go to that GitHub repository, this issue number 15, if you're interested in looking at this. But uh, that, that is quite a long discussion. This is an interesting little specific problem or, or issue with this, which is um, if we have this relationship between description set and description, is it possible for a description to be reused in a different description set? In which case, what is the relationship between those two? We have this notion of, um, at the moment, I think the default, and, and the, the thing we inherited from the DSP is the idea that the description um, sets points to the, dis sorry, the description points to the description set of which it is a part. But it might be better for the description to be able to exist and be referred to, referenced by description sets. So that, that hasn't really, um, the discussion on that one hasn't really got going yet. That's just, uh, somebody just put that, I think it was Karen again, just put that as a, you know, a problem to, to look at. Um, but obviously, once you get into that, you start to get into um, you know, identifiers, global identifiers for descriptions, and so on. Maybe that's necessary, that could become a necessary part of this. <coughs> So finally, how to get involved. Um, everything I've just described in that last session is, is really just a, a beginning. Uh, it's really early days. I mean, we've only been doing this for a few weeks. Um, so we're trying to gather more use cases. I think we don't have enough. Uh, we don't have enough range yet. Um, something I would like to see is some um, use cases from open science domains, that, that sort of thing. We don't have anything like that. So I think I know who I can talk to to gather a few of those, but um, there, there are some quite big gaps, but as I say, it is, it is an early part of the process. Um, that's the URL for the interest group, please consider joining. We have the annual conference in Seoul in September, um, and we're going to be doing quite a lot around application profiles there. Um, in fact, Karen will be there and will be speaking there. Um, we're going to run several sessions, and we're hoping that this work will be a little more advanced by September, so we can start to really um, make some progress there. And uh, please, if you represent your institution, consider joining DCMI. We need all the support we can get. Um, what I'm very keen to do is to get our organizational members to really set the agenda for what they're doing. So if this is something you care about, then that will be a useful way to influence it. And uh, that's me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. for Paul um, regarding anything you talked about. We'll also have a general discussion after both presenters are finished, but if we have any specific questions, we can take those now. Ian? So you were saying that you acknowledge that there's different languages now to capture um, uh, application profiles. Is it DCMI so to reuse one of those? Just have an application profile for the application profile? Or, or like an implementation model for, for if, if a language meets the use cases, or do you proceed developing another language for application profiles? That's very much the um, main part of the argument that's going on on the, on the list. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to prejudice that discussion. <laughs> okay. This is me Fair. weaseling out of answering your question. Right? Um, I think that, that, is, that is one of the really important questions that's come up immediately. Um, yeah. It's the extent to which we reuse, um, introduce new terminology. There are a few people um, who are saying, well, actually, you know, we could reuse terminology which we, as in the community, introduced 15 years ago, and it's actually everybody else that should adopt that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, but, but I think that, yeah. But I think that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm going to try not to, to prejudice that at all. Um, but I would be disappointed if we just invented some completely new thing without paying serious attention to. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. 
So you mentioned that there's a very uh, number of uh, people that have been in those groups, and I was wondering what type of representation is uh, on these, like what institutions and from where? I have no idea, I'm afraid. I haven't really okay. checked that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I've noticed um, a few people um, so I can give you some examples, but I haven't tracked where they're from. Um, so we have um, certainly several European academics um, who really just do a lot of research in this kind of area. They're interested in seeing this taken forward. We have um, a couple of um, Japanese guys who are um, much more on the implementation side of things. So they're very interested in. Uh, so they're very interested in Snoopy and things like that mm -hmm. as well. Um, looking at how. Whatever comes out of this can be done in a way which is implementable. So I'm very glad that they're still so involved. Um, we have a couple of people who are um, really interested in the just the they're just the interoperability people. You know, they're very interested in making sure this uh, works well with some of the W3C initiatives, for example, and if there is a related um, thing going on in W3C actually at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. the data. Uh, nature of exchange working group, I think it's called, uh, where there's some overlap here. Um, so it's quite a range, but I'm afraid I haven't followed. Um, once the, the numbers have sort of gone up, I stop following again, <laughs> stop checking. Anyone else? Okay, let's thank Paul again. Thank you. Our second speaker is Paloma. Graziani Picardo from the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin, um, where she manages the Department of Printed and Published Media Cataloging. Her areas of interest include authorities management, content standards for description of special collections, bibliographic data exchange formats, and metadata re remediation. Paloma's talk will be corralling bibframe profiles using the Sinopia Profile Editor in a shared environment. This talk will present the work of the LD4P Profiles Working Group to develop initial protocols for collaborative development of profiles in the LD4P Sinopia shared environment. So, hi, everybody. <laughs> um, as Jennifer say as a metadata librarian at the Harry Ransom Center, um, and I'm also the lead of the center's LD4P2 project. Um, I am the co-chair of the profiles, the Sinopia Profiles Working Group, um, together with Nancy Lorimer, who uh, from Stanford University. She unfortunately she could not be here today, so. Uh, I'm going to be doing the presentation solo. <laughs> uh, and I say unfortunately because she is the expert on profiles. Um, I, I have to admit that I joined the working group because I didn't know anything about profiles and our project required um, the, the development of very specific pro uh, profiles <coughs> For rare materials, so I needed to get up to speed, and that sounded like the the best way of doing it in getting involved on in those conversations. So um, bear with me. Uh, um, Jeremy Nelson is here. Uh, so if there is any very hard question that I did not answer, he has graciously agreed to to back me up on this. So uh, so why providing different profiles? Well, we thought it was a very catchy title for the <laughs> presentation, but it actually um, represents very nicely what the Profiles Working Group is trying to achieve um, in the context of a um, shared B-frame cataloging environment. So uh, when I was working on this, I was, um, I was looking at ways of typing this presentation with um, Paul's presentation, but I have to admit that I didn't knew much about <laughs> uh, the work that UCMI was doing with application profiles, so I'm very happy that I got to speak second. <laughs> and I, now I see that this is going to be basically like a case study of everything that you have presented. And a lot of the issues that you have brought up are issues that we have to be 
like we are currently dealing with. So, um, so I think that um, that would be um, interesting. So what I'm going to be talking today is, um, I'm going to be first talking a little bit about different profiles. Um, and then I will introduce the early for peace and opia profiles working group, uh, the, and the work that they are doing in terms of best practices for using profiles in a, um, in a shared environment. And finally, I'm going to do some, um, a quick demo of the workflows for creating, using, and management profiles in Sinopia and in GitHub. Sorry, but I have to move into different places. So, um, the different model is by definition very, very flexible, um, as it should be able to accommodate the needs of uh, existing vocabularies and also vocabularies that have not yet been developed but will be needed by different communities. Um, so the different profile allowed to provide um, link data editing tools with ways of con constraining these vocabularies. Um, so this is an attempt to like put as much information about how a what a B-frame profile is at this point in just like one slide. So um, um, as you can see, a profile, uh, it, is, it is kind of like a nested model. So a profile is a container for one or more resource templates. Um, a resource template is a container for uh, a single resource. So this could be compared with like a class in an ontology. Uh, and it's associated property templates. And then a property template uh, is a um, container for a single property and its attributes and associated values and associated, um, <coughs> associated values. Um, so, so how, um, how the, the different um, values that are, um, a property can can be um, can be linked into it can be either like um, a literal, so it can be a text string or a control vocabulary or to another resource template. Uh, so that's where things get very complex when you are like linking to another resource template that then starts a new uh, a new set of properties. So it, it, it can be very, very complex. Um, as the B-frame uh, profiles um, that have been developed by the Library of Congress and those are the ones that uh, we are starting from in Sinopia, there's, um, these different types of profiles so far, and when you are talking about, uh, Paul was talking about how you call things, and this is one of the things where like, it, it's hard when there are not defined names for things, because then it's, it's very hard to explain how, um, uh, or everybody can be on the same page. So um, with the profiles um, working group, we try to create this, typology of profiles to make it easier to understand. Um, you can have a primary profile and this is going to be the one that it's basically based on a format. It's what you are going to be used if you are, um, if just for cataloging a resource. But then you can also create a resource template a standing alone resource template. It still has to link within a profile, so we also call it profile, but you will never use that to catalog a resource. It's just something that probably will be called from a primary profile. And then um, there's uh, another variety of these, which is like a bunch of different standalone resource templates that get, um, get on the same, um, uh, live on the same profile because they have some sort of uh, relationship. So, so it's a way of collating them, and that's why the provisional name is collating profile. Um, 
so so this is um, this is what like this is the conceptual model of, of the profile right now. Um, Are you going to have that up somewhere because I can't I can't read it. Oh, I'm sorry. It is right there now are, on, the, 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 um, on the on uh, the presentation. Um, <laughs> each um, for the LD4, there's a Google Drive, and each um, session will have the presentation, okay. and this one is, is in there. So, um, because this is um, this is a collaborative environment, there's like a series of um, anticipated risks. So working in a collaborative environment facilitates profile and resource sampling reviews, but there that doesn't come without a cost. There's going to there's until there are best practices defined, there's going to be uh, there's like this issue of like proliferation of profiles and then um, a series of um, issues that might come with uh, when different institutions are reducing uh, profiles and resource templates that have been developed by another institution. So, of course, there's a lot of benefits on reducing profiles. Uh, creating a profile is um, it's very resource intensive. Uh, so, reducing some other institution profile saves you time. You will uh, remain up to date with any changes to that profile, and um, your data will be compatible with all uh, those who use the same templates. But the risk with this is that when you are reducing some other institutions' profiles, uh, you don't have control over the profile. Um, the owner can change it at any time. Uh, the profile owner might remove a resource, and that will um, that you need for the description of your of your own resources. Uh, at, the, the profile owner might add a resource template or a property, and that all the sudden might confuse the catalogers that are used to work, your catalogers that are used to work with a very specific template. And, um, and they might just change. So things that you have um, catalog with a specific profile, all the sudden data is going to disappear if the owner of the profile changes. So that is why that is why the Synopia Profiles Working Group was created. So in November 2018, uh, Nancy Lorimer submitted a message to the um, to the to the Google Group to to get that conversation started and calling for. Um, participants in this working group, uh, and the group was formed. The main task of this group is developing these practices for Synopia, but there's, um, there's other, other tasks um, that we are working on. So here you can see um, the level of completion. So we are still working on the, uh, on the best practices, but um, there is some um, documentation for how to use the profile editor that has already been created, and uh, we submitted um, a survey to figure out what profiles were going to be needed um, according to different core institution projects, and uh, there is a kind of like a protocol for feedback of pre-existing um, LC profiles. Um, Future work will be working with PCC on best practices for the establishment of PCC and their uh, profiles and assist uh, LC with, with training. Um, here are also the institutions that are represented on this working group. And um, a link to the, to the wiki. Um, there's many ways of um, getting up to date with the work of the working group because we have a, a drive on the public drive of the There is um, uh, there's a section of, on the LD4P wiki and there's also a channel on the LD4S Slack. Uh, and we also have a Google group. So, so 
the the Synopia best practices that we're working on, um, I have divided this section into best practices for metadata fields and then best practices for creation, best practices for cloning, best practices for uh, for reusing. So the first one is best practices for for metadata field. And as you can see here, this is the metadata for a profile and the metadata for a resource template. And there are reasons why it was important to create best practices for this. Um, the, for instance, the, the title is what's going to allow to um, um, to scroll the different existing profiles. So, so it, it was important to include who had developed the, the what institution had developed the profile, what the profile is about, so that just by a glance and um, a, um, a person that needs to chose the profile can can tell all the information. So um, the ID um, the ID has to be unique, uh, and it also has to state whether it is a profile or a resource template, give some information about the content of the template profile, and um, collate an institution's profile together in a in in a potential list. Um, the best practices are still a draft, so they would be, once they are ready, they would be announced and published, but um, they are on the on the drive, so I'm just not going to now like say every single thing of these, but just to show that um, ID, title, author are, um, are required fields and again the the author is to make sure that there is a person that is responsible for the profile. So because the intention here is that if you want to reduce the profile you need to establish a, a contact with the institution that has developed that um, that profile. Um, so so the next, um, the next issue that the, the working group has to, has to think about is um, providing more context in when, when, it's, when it makes sense to create a resource uh, um, a new profile or a new resource template, and or when will it be more uh, efficient to just reduce one and or or clone it and then change some. Um, change some of the of the properties. So, um, why would be the reasons to create a profile or a resource template? We have a, I have already said that it's really very resource uh, intensive, and I have I have seen it from myself <laughs> um, because I've been testing with it. Um, so you might want to describe a format that is not uh, represented on the current profiles and the existing um, the existing profiles that are going to be ready in Synopia when, when catalogers can start this project going are profiles that have been developed by the Library of Congress on their pilot. So, so not all the form, the, those profiles don't cover all the formats and you have different um, different projects from core institutions that are going to require profiles that don't yet exist. Uh, so those ones will have to be created. Um, you can you want to use a B-frame extension that is not yet represented in a current profile. So maybe you are interested in one of the profiles. For instance, the Library of Congress profile has um, one for rare materials, but it doesn't include the ARM ontology extension. So, if you want to add any of those um, any of those classes or properties into the profile, you need to you need to <coughs> either create a new one or, or just clone it, but still have to, to do a lot of additions to it. Um, or you want to cover a format more broadly. You want to to be more specific than the one that already exists. Um, Etc. Um, you can. So why would you? The next 
the other one is like, why would you want to create a new resource template? And it's basically the same. You are you will still have to develop a profile where that new resource template is, but you might want to add local defaults to a resource template um, or replace a vocabulary. So if there is um, if there is a a value that is a lookup for for a um, existing control vocabulary, but that's not the one you want to use, then you will have to create a new resource template. Uh, and then add, um, add or replace a resource template that is being referred from to, from another uh, current property. So you might decide that you need a new profile. You don't want to start from scratch, so the solution will be to clone an existing profile. Um, it prevents you from having to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I feel that that's a typo, but it allows you to access to others' expertise, and, and it also in, encourages the standard building when we all collaborate on profile uh, development. Um, we can actually discuss about the standards. Uh, the way to clone in profiles um, currently is to change the ID and label for all the pro uh, for the profile and all the resource templates that are is included in the profile. And then once the profile is yours, then that means that it's your ID for every single resource template and the profile, then you can do whatever you want. Um, again, that's very dangerous because if you ch if you do some alteration on a profile but you are not changing the ID and you are not changing the label, you're just changing somebody else's profile. Um, this. So, so that's the next question. Can I just add to a profile rather than cloning it? Only individuals from the same group, and this is going to be the institution that has created the profile. So uh, I don't think that this has started yet, yet but um, probably affinity groups are also going to be developing profiles that are specific for, for a format that around the um, what the affinity group was created, and those will get be part of that group that has um, the um, the privilege to update profile and. I'm not quite sure how work, how groups, and that's probably something that Jeremy can talk about in the paper. <laughs> I don't know about like, the, the state of the groups right now. So, uh, based on the cohort and uh, their desire, we're right now not having that restriction that you can only edit profile or resource templates that are in your group. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the cohort will be able to uh, write or use any other uh, so we're not doing any rights management right now at the resource template level. I would mention though that one of the advantages of the sort of the, the back end link data platform we're using is that we do have sort of the, the metadata surrounding who did what on these resource templates. So um, you know, if someone goes and we can go in and see who did what at what time. Mm -hmm. So we do have like an, an audit trail uh, it might not, at least this first work cycle, it may be a little bit harder. You might have to contact the developers if you have that question, but we do have that history. So, that, uh, I mean, again, if you want to update a profile, and it is either if it's your profile or somebody else's profile, you have to remember that others might be using it. And that's kind of like, the whole concept of profiles in the wild, because <laughs> because it is at this point there is there are no rules. I mean, we are like just building the best practices. So there's very little that it can be controlled with the system. It is more of like being very conscious that you are working on a shared environment and that you can be messing with somebody else's work and somebody else's profile. So. Um, this is um, this 
I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that these are uh, initial best practices for the very early stages of use uh, of Sinopia. And uh, they are based on, on trying to figure out worst case scenarios, but <coughs> there might be other scenarios that we cannot figure out now. So as we keep on working on it, we probably will uh, be able to, to figure out better ways of addressing these issues. But so far, the, the best practice would be if you are updating your own profile, you want to contact everybody else that is using the profile or the resource template in advance, and um, also detail the changes that you are making uh, in your GitHub documentation. And I will be talking more about it later because um, when I show what the management workflow is. But, um, just as a quick um, intro, uh, all the profiles are being managed on GitHub. So we have the, um, the version control and the possibility of also like add um, explanation to the profiles that uh, we are developing. And then if you are reducing someone else's profile, the best practice would be to contact, uh, contact them and let them know um, that you are using that uh, can actually document who else is using the profile on their um, GitHub readme file. So now, uh, th this was an attempt to try to lay out all the different um, um, issues that might come up on uh, when you are working on a collaborative environment. So now it's time to present the hero of this presentation, the profile wrangler. <laughs> so that was uh, that was Nancy's idea. <laughs> uh, um, but it fits very nicely in this whole like Coralian profiles. Um, this is a point person for profiles for each core institution. So that's one of the things that the profile working group try to, to gather this information. Get one person per institution that will be in charge of um, managing and maintaining the profiles in their institutional directory in the L4P GitHub. Um, ensure that the profiles follow best practices. Um, provide initial review and training for other um, other members of the institution that will also be developing profiles and, and be the primary contact um, for the institution to the core or any question that may, may, may come up regarding profiles. So this doesn't mean that the profile runner is the only one that is going to be developing profiles, but it's the gatekeeper of the profiles and kind of the, the responsible uh, person for all the profiles in the institution. <clears throat> so now I'm going to show um, pretty quick how is um, this um, core institutions subdirectory that I, I was talking about before. So this was also decided as um, I'm not sure if as a temporary thing, but it was like we needed to figure out a place to store these profiles, make them available, and so that different institutions can see what profiles are available, and also keep some um, um, track changes, which like uh, Git is perfect for, so that's why um, we are currently storing the profiles on our own subdirectory in this hub. So I can jump pretty quick here and, and show where this is. Um, this is on the LD4P GitHub. Um, Profiles from the existing profiles from Library Congress. 
but it also includes the profiles that core institutions have been working on. So every single institution has its own um, its own subdirectory, and that's what makes that institution the owner of the profile. That's if you want to um, if you want to update or if you want to. Um, suggest, because you cannot update other institutions' profile, but if you want to suggest um, an update of a profile because you have um, seen that there is um, an error or something, you can do it through a pull request uh, here in GitHub. And right now, there's not a lot going on here because this is like the very, very early stages. Everybody is just testing and uploading their, their test profiles. But um, because every institution has been defined as a way of also documenting what they are doing and what the profiles include. And University of Washington um, actually developed this very nice um, core profiles table of content. So they, they have added it to, they have added it to this, uh, the core profiles directory, and it is a, they, um, it is some JavaScript that runs through, through the directory and gets all the different profiles with the resource templates, so that you can actually, without having to click every single institution now, who is working on what, and which ones are the resource templates, and then you can decide if that's the one that you're interested in or not. And they are, so far, updating it every week. Uh, we, it's yet to be seen how often that actually would be useful to be at the end, but I thought it's a very nice thing that we have this table of contents of all the profiles. Um, so, for that, and then, um, so this is um, the workflow as it exists right now, the suggested workflow by the, um, um, by the uh, best practices, uh, by the profiles working group, so there are different ways of working on profiles. Um, if you are, um, I, I have created here three different paths, so depending on what exactly you want to achieve. So uh, number one, if you want to clone an existing profile, you will start on, on GitHub, you will um, download the profile JSON file in your desktop, then you will upload it into the Synopia profile editor, and then you will export it and save it in your desktop file. Um, if you want to do further JSON edits uh, on on another um, on a test editor or an XML editor, you can do it. Uh, and actually, there is um, there are JSON schemas that have been developed uh, to validate profiles that will work on Synopia. So you can, you can, if you are working outside of the Synopia profile editor, you can, you can still validate your profiles so that uh, you can make sure that they are going to be uh, valid in the Synopia data editor. Um, if not, you can just upload it into Synopia um, and start cataloging. Um, there's another, another possible workflow uh, you want to create a new profile, and you start on the Synopia pro profile editor. Uh, you will create it. The, um, I, this, um, this is very complex because the Synopia profile, profile editor is uh, purposely separated from the link data editor. So everything you have to like create there, but it doesn't save it. You have to save it into your desktop, and then you have to upload it into Synopia. Um, so you will create it there, then export again if there's anything that you need to, to edit uh, because you want to add. Um, right now there's uh, certain, um, certain um, 
properties that uh, you cannot create on the Synopia editor because um, if you want to refer to an, a resource template that is not currently loaded on the Synopia editor, you need to uh, do that manually outside. So that's why I'm adding that extra step of um, just doing it manually. Again, you can, if you have to do that, you can validate and then you can uh, upload it. If not, um, you will just upload it into Synopia and, and start cataloging. And then, um, of course, you can just start from scratch on your edi on, on that editor and skip the whole profile, Synopia profile editor. And um, maybe you just want to clone a profile so you can start on um, getting it from GitHub and then doing the uh, all the all the uh, edits that you want to do on your um, text or code editor of preference. And this is just to show like the complexity of uh, the workflow. Uh, the best practice is, is going to always be everything that you use, put it in GitHub. And make sure that everything that, uh, all the profiles that you are going to be using on, on the Synopia link data editor should be in GitHub so that other institutions can, can reuse them if they need to. Um, and then the next part of this presentation is going to be uh, showing how, how these tools look. I really don't want to get too much into detail yet because Jeremy is going to be doing a presentation <laughs> later on Synopia. <laughs> and I just thought that um, we've talked about it, so it makes sense to show it. So um, I'll just, um, this is just a walkthrough, so I'm not going to be talking in much detail about uh, all the all the um, technology behind. But again, you will be on, you will start on, on GitHub. I'm going to go to the Ransom Center because we already have some stuff there. Uh, so again, everything is test right now. Um, and you will just, and those you have to like click on it. So um, safety as and that's creating the JSON file on your desktop. Then you will come here. Um, this is the main page of Synopia, so if you are going to be uploading it into the profile editor, um, you will have to go to the profile editor. You don't need to be um, logged in to work with the profile editor. Uh, as you can see, you can create a new profile or you can import, so I'm just going to import that one. And I'm not quite sure if this is going to, <laughs> if it's going to validate. <laughs> It does. Awesome. So <laughs> I couldn't check it for a week, so I, I wasn't sure. But um, here you can see how the profile looks as a JSON file. And here you can see how, how it looks on the profile editor. So I have all the metadata for this profile. Then I have uh, one of the resource templates. So it, oh, sorry. it has the metadata for the resource templates and all the different properties and um, all the different attributes of the properties. Uh, in this case, it is um, it is a control vocabulary from um, RBMS. So because it's not published as link as RDF, the the um, type of value that the property can can take is a literal. Another example would be this one where uh, it is it is um, 
the value will be a term from AAP, so in this case, it will be a, a lookup, and I can, I, and I can indicate as one of the attributes of, of this property that the value should come from this control vocabulary. Um, using the question algorithm theory is that is what um, um, Steve is working on. So <laughs> if there's questions about that, I'm happy that he's also in the room. Um, so then you will do whatever updates you need to do because this is a demo. This will not be the type of profile that you upload into Synopia because it's not a primary profile. Um, but just for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to support it. So here you will see that um, the second one is the um, segregation that I just reported. I haven't touched anything, so it's just going to be the same, the same file. But now that it's on my desktop, I can go to the link data editor and the editor. <coughs> So uh, I would say go to development.snowpeer.io. Okay. Um, we're having some issues with the uh, authentication service. So how would it be the development? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you know if you have a login? I do. Oh, you do? OK. But so I have it on my computer. Oh. <laughs> the same, so I don't no, know. Well, yeah, just go to development.snowpeer.io. Okay, uh, it's, I mean, do I need to show? It's just like, um, this will be the last step on the workflow. Once you upload it into Synopia, then. Well, if you log into this environment, you actually can see the listing of the uh, resource template that people have uploaded. Oh, awesome. So, so do you want yeah. to do it three times? Yeah. yeah. This is basically almost the end. Yeah, okay. <laughs> saying this already shows all the different and this is also quite new, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a bigger one than the other uh, on production. So you can see all the different templates that um, and profiles that all the institutions have already uploaded. I'm just going to upload this one just to show. So um, in this case it will this will be a uh, a collating profile that has different resource templates that relate in some way uh, that I might want to use as a, a link into another profile. But so it has an error. <laughs> but um, that would be the workflow. That's that's what I wanted to show. And so that's. Um, that would be the website, and then I can go to the page. So yeah, uh, thanks so much. <laughs> uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer if I have the answer, or maybe Jeremy can help me with that. Um, these are the co our contacts, so Nancy Lurimer and um, and I can be reached just by email, or uh, there is a profile channel on, on Slack, and those are our Slack um, names. Thank you. Do we have one? Uh, 
Um, I'm struck by the fact that everyone's quoting quote files. Um, have you guys analyzed the changes that institutions are making to profiles for like material? Uh, not yet, because I don't know how many institutions are. I mean, everybody's testing at, at this point, and I, um, I'm one of the member of one of the institutions that this is the first LE40 project that um, that we are part of, and there's many institutions like me that are just trying to figure out their way around. Uh, even like on last project, um, on the on the first phase, the profiles were using a different. Uh, like we're being developed in shackles. So everybody's trying to figure out how the whole profile happens. So there are not that many use cases yet to actually do that analysis, but that's a, that's a very interesting question. Like why, why uh, institutions will choose to turn a profile as going away from like this is the norm. So I guess as we move forward and and see how that's happening, uh, further conversations can come and affinity groups can be created that that will actually um, develop a canonic profile that it's more useful than the existing one. So I have a sort of related question. Um, I, I was a little unclear. It, it seems to me there are two paths for cloning. You can be cloning within the Sanofi environment or you can be Mm -hmm. Is that no, so um, the profile editor is not the place where the profile lives. The profile editor is just the place where you edit the profile. So um, the profile lives in GitHub. And if you want to clone it, you need to retrieve it from GitHub. Oh. And so the audit trail, which you mentioned, which is in the Sanofi system, is in the Sanofi yeah. And that seems to sort of collide with the Git history. No, it really has nothing to do with, with Git history. It's storing the actual resource template as a uh, non-RDF data stream within our, our Trellis and data platform. And in that Trellis, it, it contains memento uh, tokens for every change that occurs. So that's, that's where we can get that history. Of, uh, but it's not related to, to GitHub. So once, once so that's I- sort of my question mm -hmm. though. What, what, I, what I mean by collide in a sense, it's not clear to me where the real audit history is. Is it collide with GitHub? Or is it? So the, the, it, it's, it's being maintained both, uh, but the, uh, what actually Sanofia is using What's, what's internal to Sanofia. Um, the, the only real uh, check we do when uh, a cohort member uploads a profile that contains resource templates is that we check to see if that resource template exists based on the ID that they put in. If it does, you'll get a warning message that says, do you want to overwrite or do you want to like, you know, change it, change the ID to, to make it something else. Um, there are some compromises given the sort of really accelerated uh, time frame we have to get Snowpea yeah. out. Uh, I think in a future work cycle, what we'd like to do is to not have this whole separate step where people create profiles and then have to export and then uh, maintain it on GitHub, but do it out of everything within the Snowpea environment. Ah, uh, okay. So that's your roadmap. Is. That's our roadmap going forward. But th th this was uh, a way we could, because we're trying to organize because we have all these moving so we sort of isolate uh, the management of profiles that have resource templates that are being developed by the cohort so they can get, get started on that process. Mm -hmm. It struck me that one of the, the, the I am gonna say something but I can write it. Oh, it struck me that there's a use case around versioning and um, and whether or not we should be pointing to versions of a profile so that should one change, um, you're protected from that, and if you opt into the, the new one, um, yeah. I mean, it's not a no, novel idea, but it's not what the one we're doing. It's not the way we're using them now. If we don't have, um, in the Snowpea context anyways, we don't have um, 
template IDs that reflect the version. No. So um, I'm John Chapman, I work at OCLC, I'm in charge of our cataloging applications. And um, you know, this brought up something that we heard more and more recently, which is um, you know, we have this ideal of a shared catalog, the world cap. Um, but there's been lots of sort of edge cases where um, the model of one set of validation rules to rule them all has been extended and stretched a little bit to allow for some specific applications. So increasingly we're seeing what, what I call the don't touch my stuff um, ideal, which is you know people wanting to have stuff in WorldCat but really worried that other people are gonna mess it up. And um, so I'm interested in that dynamic and how it's going to play out here, um, and also making sure that um, how this fits in with stuff like constraints, definitions, and um, shackle, and all that stuff to make sure that even though you can say whatever you want, everybody can understand what you're saying. <laughs> so I guess this is just a comment to say, like, we're watching, we're listening to the profiles discussions. If you have great ideas for us and how we can play a role, we're all you. So I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, just, I, I, I also have a comment. You know, if you want to go to too specific to if I, I, by modifying the existing profile thing to meet your own needs, that is a its own thing. So nobody will, nobody can actually you your data is going to be very very stuck in the very small. I agree with that point that the, the group is trying to figure out all these use cases because I mean that's going to happen in like the profiles that we are developing. Like we also need actually systems that display them. So if everybody um, and I think that's something that you have also mentioned. I mean somebody's like I don't know how to start, but like the system is not going to take it because it's not actually design to read those extra properties or whatever, like how, how that, so yeah, it has to be a community agreement on like what these profiles are. And then the changes can be made in which level is also important as well. It's going to be just the value or properties are different or similar. So how can we accomplish this? How, how is it important? I just want to make a, a Follow on comments about versioning because I think versioning is going to be a problem that we need to start to think about soon. Um, but I think versioning is there are actually two two aspects to this, and, uh, and they can be quite bad and conflated sometimes. So there's the versioning which we now take for granted in things like Git, which is all about development. Um, but then there's versioning which is more I think what you were talking about, which is um, people being confident that they're using a particular version of but this is about releasing. Yeah, there's named releases. Yeah. yeah, and those two things are quite different. Um, they really, they sound the same, but they actually have very different components. So the mechanisms are different and so on. And we need to try and figure out that. The second one of those is really about publishing, not about developing. Yeah. Is there, I'm wondering if the reason why there aren't more profiles up, up right now is that people are unsure of themselves, or they don't they don't want somebody else to touch their stuff, or does, any, does anybody? Uh, you mean in the in the context of this of the LD forty project? Yeah, I would say people are trying to figure it out. So there's, mm, uh, I I. I think that apart from the ones that come from Bayer's Congress and the ones that um, Cornell has been working on, I don't know that there's any like kind of non-test profile yet uh, to be used. So I think everybody's trying to figure it out. I think for us, we're waiting until the editor is ready and then we're gonna see what profiles are, you know, the, the frame profiles if those will, will be sufficient for what we're doing, that we may not even need to create a different application profile because 
something may already exist that we can use. Mm -hmm. So everyone's waiting for someone else to do it. <laughs> no, well, or just for the different and her profiles, the, the ones that they're using already, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's hard because we are like at this point that we cannot actually use the profiles on the, on the editor. We are thinking in abstract, and yeah. and there's not like a proof of concept of this profile is going to work and right. do exactly what I want it to do. So and I would follow up that uh, we are closing in, I'll say, on milestone three in our project, and that will give the opportunity for people to upload their profile and just actually see it in the editor itself. Mm -hmm. So um, we are not going to be saving any data that's generated from the form itself, but at least give people opportunity to see um, what it would look like and um, you know, hopefully provide us uh, feedback on, on sort of what works for them and what doesn't. You know, that we have time for one more? We have time for two more, actually, because we're a little bit over, but we don't want to stand in. We didn't really talk much about human readability of, of the profiles, and you touched on it, I think you, well, when you were saying a little bit earlier, um, is there any work on like style sheets for, because the, the profile editor in the Snopia context, you can kind of read that if you want to jump through the recursive link templates and in like Shex and Shackle, it's the same thing and you either read the RDF or I don't know, I guess it would be nice to see some human readable for the metadata for the humans. And in I, the I, will, I will add to it that um, there's like some contextual information that is missing on the profile because when you are when you are calling to a resource template that doesn't live in the profile, you don't know. What, I mean, unless you go and look yeah. for the resource template, it's it's kind of a leap of faith. <laughs> uh, if you are reviewing it, uh, a profile, you have to assess if that's what works for you. You really need to be opening a bunch of different profiles because uh, once resource templates are being reviewed from different profiles. <coughs> Uh, collating profiles is when, when you get into the rabbit hole of like, uh, you can be <coughs> linking to a resource template that links to another resource template that links to another resource template. So yeah, something that allows you to actually have the big picture of what you are actually using. And especially if, uh, if the humans are both metadata folks and developers, because developers are having to do different types of profile syntax too. So how do they understand the model? Expected behavior. I think human readable documentation on these profiles would be useful. I have mostly a, re a request, unless there's a ready answer for it. Um, I'd be interested in knowing, I mean, you surfacing your pain points. I mean, I've heard some of these pain points from like Jody about the fact that, you know, it's time consuming and laborious. My, my suspicion is that there's something we can do about that. I don't know what. One of the things that struck me that doesn't exist currently in the, 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 the different profile spec, which is a word that's bigger than what the thing is, but um, uh, is there's really no way to import properties. So you can reuse resource templates. I don't think you can reuse property templates. And there's no way, for example, to define um, a property template and then import it that would have a set number mm -hmm. of properties that are reused in many, many places and then re-import that. So you have this laborious process where if you want to add a label to everything, you have to go into everything and add a label mm -hmm. to it versus being able to import it. Um, that's just one example that has occurred to me that it's somewhere along the line that that doesn't exist and that's probably one of the reasons but the request being is like capture some of those pain points because there's got to be something that can be done about it. Also, we should feed them back to the development core group because you're going to, these pain points will, you know, if you get it to a certain point, it'll come up. And, yeah. Sure. Okay, I think we can thank Paloma and Paul for their presentations. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you.